First of all, let me thank you all. Let me thank uh, Mr. Barnes, uh, Mr. George, and all the organizers for this great opportunity to share my latest research as it relates to the immune system, immunotherapy, and the microbiota, and of course, as it all this relates uh, to uh, the long uh, uh, debated uh, issue of HIV and AIDS and how the two things are associated if they are. And of course, I wish to thank you all for being there. I see you in the hall and I hope that you will enjoy this talk of mine. A very important thing before I start, uh, the contents of this presentation are for informational purposes only and they are absolutely not intended to be substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment. So I'm not giving you any medical advice. And since I guess you're coming from all parts of the world, please check with your national, state, regional, county authority, canton if you're in Switzerland, for the current legal situation concerning the applications of the approaches that will be described in this talk. And also, I wish to openly disclose my conflicts of interest. As you may know, after I left the University of Florence, Italy, I founded a company in Switzerland that is called Silver Spring, and it is dedicated to research, development, and production of probiotics that are based on advanced microbiome research. I am the inventor of Bravo, which is a sort of a super yogurt and all its derivatives as well as a number of other supplements and remedies that may be considered in a number of conditions as a complementary approach. Today's talk will focus on the role of the microbiome in HIV AIDS. Now I remember when I had the honor and the privilege in 2009 to attend the RA or Rethinking AIDS conference in Auckland that I heard uh, many times uh, uh, people talking about gut dysbiosis. Please remember that in 2009, very few people, if any, were talking about the microbiome or the microbiota, and the general consensus was this, that microbes in general were our enemies, and that we uh, to perform all efforts to get rid of all microbes. So in 2009, this awareness that actually we are more microbial than human, that, that most microbes are truly our friends and they determine the function of all our organs and systems, in particular the immune system. This awareness was not present in the, most of the medical scientific community. So it was a kind of a surprise to hear at the uh, RA conference in 2009 that gut dysbiosis actually could have been one of the con causes or one of the concurring causes for immune deficiency in AIDS as well as in other conditions. So I remember that event very, very fondly and uh, I still have wonderful memories of that event, both from the human point of view as well as from the scientific point of view. And now it's almost 10 years since that event and many things have happened. Uh, the following year, in 2010, we had the opportunity to attend two conferences uh, that were almost contemporary at the same time in Vienna, Austria. One was organized by Christian Fiala and Dr. Uta Santos Koenig and was a so-called alternative conference where Professor Bauer, myself and many other members of Rethinking Gates were present. And was, uh, it was almost in coincidence uh, with uh, the 18th International AIDS Conference, the mainstream conference that was held in Vienna in almost the same days with 25,000 participants coming from all over the world. And I had the opportunity to present my data at both conferences and what I presented at the mainstream conference it was a study performed together with Dr. Yamamoto from Philadelphia, USA and my wife, Dr. Pacini. Uh, that actually was consistent and in line with the famous words of Professor Luc Montagnier, that is, if you have a good immune system, you can get rid of HIV as many times as you wish, because that paper uh, demonstrated how stimulation of the immune system without fighting HIV, without even trying to fight HIV, with a powerful immune stimulating molecule that is, was called the GCMAF, macrophage activating factor, could actually answer this uh, question, this debated question, uh, who comes first, the immune system or the HIV? 
And then the following year, in 2011, in Rome, there was uh, uh, another conference, another mainstream conference from the International AIDS Society that was uh, dedicated on antiretroviral therapies. And again, we elaborated on the role of the immune system and how empowering the immune system could have been an excellent strategy, not only uh, to fight immune deficiencies, but also to fight those cancers uh, that are frequently associated with immune deficiencies. All these documents are available online. I would say that uh, uh, almost all papers I will be showing today are freely available online in the open access of public domain. And of course, as you may know, in the same year 2011, uh, together with colleagues, uh, uh, David Rasnick is there, and Peter Duesbeck, I think you all know him, and Klaus Kenlein, Christian Fiala, Professor Henry Bauer, and myself, we published this paper in the Italian Journal of Anatomy and Embryology that caused a big, big, big controversy. And we were threatened to be fired from the university. There were investigations. But eventually, the information held, and the paper is still there. It has never been, it has been widely criticized from all sides but it has never been retracted for the very simple fact that the information that is written there is absolutely tenable. I mean, no one can disprove the information that it is there. And uh, now, nine years later, the paper is uh, still there and everybody can read it if you're interested in knowing the true extent of this so-called lethal epidemic of uh, AIDS uh, in Africa or elsewhere. But uh, we moved on. And today we know a lot about uh, the microbiota, uh, this gut dysbiosis that was mentioned in 2009. Now we know much, much more and how it relates to health and disease at every stage of our life. This is one of the many uh, schemes or diagrams or pictures you can find all over the literature where you can say that uh, the microbiota is involved in all ages uh, from where when you are, we are newborn until we are uh, senior citizens, uh, as uh, elderly people are called. And uh, it is involved in the function of all organs, uh, from the brain uh, to the gut uh, to the um, circulatory system, uh, the vagus nerve. So essentially the microbiota, that is this array of microbes uh, that are ubiquitous, that are everywhere in our body, influences the development and the function of all organs. And here you see in this slide taken from science that this biosis again is mentioned as a major cause for disease. And of course, like many other things, nobody knows whether the egg or the hen can who comes first, so whether gut dysbiosis or dysbiosis in general is a consequence of the disease or vice versa if dysbiosis is the cause of diseases. Probably both statements are true because every type of chronic condition is always accompanied by dysbiosis, which means imbalance the composition of the microbial strains in our body and this in turn leads to a number of uh, pathological developments. Uh, what is most important is that, uh, for our, in our context of course, is that uh, the altered microbiota plays an essential role in the dysfunction of the immune system. Now, we know a lot about uh, the human microbiota and I would say also the, about the microbiota of many other species. And what we know is that there are many distinct microbiota, each one performing a specific function. Uh, don't bother to try to uh, look at, in detail at this very complex slide. By the way, I already uh, gave all these slides, so you should have them. And, uh, uh, but essentially, this slide says uh, that every site of our body has a peculiar composition of microbes, and these microbes, they perform a specific function. Uh, here you see the different strains like Actina bacteria, Bacteroides, Ephemeris, Proteobacteria, and so on. Don't worry, unless you want to become a microbiologist, uh, these uh, names make little sense, but the concept is that just like our organs are, of course, diversified, 
the function of the liver is different from the function of the brain. Well, also the microbiota is diversified. So the function of the microbes in the gut is different from the function of the microbes in the skin. And if you take a look at PubMed and you look for microbiota and immune system, you end up with thousands of papers, thousands of peer review papers. Here, this latest search that was performed a couple of days ago yielded 4,385 papers. And you can read a lot about the interplay between the gut microbiota and the immune system and the immune microbiota interactions in health and disease. So you can uh, read a lot, but the uh, consensus is that, uh, and here I would uh, paraphrase uh, Professor Luc Montagnier with all due respect, if you have a good microbiota, you can get rid of all diseases, not only HIV. So the good microbiota seems to be essential for our health. Now, what is precisely the role of the microbiota in HIV AIDS? And again, uh, who comes first? Alterations in the microbiota or HIV AIDS immune deficiency? <clears throat> well, the role is pretty much uh, clear and we know by now that playing with the microbiota, essentially reconstituting the microbiota yields great benefits in people living with HIV AIDS. You will have noticed that by now, I have not steered any controversy. I am a fully mainstream, so I talk about HIV AIDS as if it were something where there was a general consensus. But I hope that you will stay with me for a while because you will learn, hopefully, a number of very interesting things. So let me elaborate on this paper. This paper was published in 2010, so it's eight years old by uh, researchers working in Canada. Actually, Professor Gregor Reid uh, is one of the top microbiologists in the world, uh, together with researchers working in Italy and the Netherlands. So it's a multi-centric study. Essentially, uh, these researchers, uh, they went to Tanzania, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, where it is said there is a very high incidence and prevalence of HIV and AIDS. And they found uh, an impoverished uh, suburban area in a place called Mwanza. And essentially what they did was to go there, bring their yogurt cultures and teach local women to produce a probiotic yogurt. Uh, they even established a little micro economy because uh, those who could pay for this probiotic yogurt paid, those who couldn't, uh, they had a probiotic uh, yogurt for free. So essentially they taught uh, these uh, women, local women, how to produce a yogurt. They had brought the strains from Canada and they gave this yogurt, this probiotic yogurt uh, to population, to whoever came there. And uh, the, some of these uh, people were monitored for their immune status and the conclusions are reported here the introduction of probiotic yogurt made by local women. So we're not talking about big pharma, we're not talking about antiretrovirals, we're talking about a probiotic yogurt made by local women in one of the poorest places on earth, a low-income community in Tanzania, was significantly associated with an increase in CD4 count among consumers living with HIV. So, uh, as you know, the efficacy of antiretroviral drugs is measured uh, by the number of CD4, and also the severity of the disease is measured by the number of CD4. So here at P, it appears, and actually it was very, very clear, that if you consume a probiotic yogurt, your CD4 increase. But of course, since uh, these people are top-notch scientists, uh, they did something more than this. So uh, let's uh, elaborate a little bit more and let's uh, read it together and let's uh, try to interpret their words. Uh, they say, this is from their work, uh, studies conducted in Africa have estimated, and you know that uh, estimates uh, not always uh, are the same as facts, but in any case, have estimated the average annual increase in CD4 count is 90 cells with ARV treatment. So if you take antiretrovirals, the estimate is that your CD4, they will increase of about 90 cells per year. And the decline is 20 to 50 cells if you don't take uh, antiretrovirals. 
Now, in this study, in the study performed in Tanzania, a similar rate of increase was observed with 99 cells with ARV. So those who took the antiretrovirus and the yogurt, they had an increase of 99 cells. So you may say, well, a little bit more than the antiretrovirus alone. But the next sentence is in, it's interesting. No significant decrease was observed without HRV treatment. So this means that those who did not take antiretrovirus for whatever reason, but they took the yogurt, experienced no decrease. And I, I would say that this is an interesting result. So uh, they make all the calculations and they say the results of this study indicate that probiotic yogurt consumption is associated with an overall increase in CD4 of 62 cells per year. And they also say something uh, that may please uh, those who are not uh, so excited about antiretrovirals. And they say, well, this could be due to an accelerated immune reconstitution after initiation of ARV thus shortening the time of severe immune deficiency. Or, and this is uh, uh, the uh, controversial sentence, may be due to an increase in CD4 count among those not yet eligible for ARV treatment, which may potentially delay the need for ARV medication. So essentially, what do they write in rather plain English? Well, a little bit hidden between the lines, but I think it's rather plain English. If you have a low CD4, if you have HIV, and you take the probiotic yogurt, you can do without ARVs because, as it says, may potentially delay the need for ARV medication. Well, uh, this paper was not uh, very well accepted by the medical scientific community and was heavily criticized, even though it was proposing something uh, doable, something feasible, something uh, we know economic interest, they had no competing interest in all these. And essentially, the main criticism was that uh, they say, well, who, who were they? The critics. The critics said, well, nice results, interesting, but you know, uh, you cannot uh, produce probiotic yogurts all over Africa. It's uh, a very limited experiment, a very limited observation cannot be applied all over the continent, so essentially its significance is very, very limited. What if you made, sorry, uh, are you still there? I don't hear any noise in the uh, hall. Can you hear me? Uh, give me a sign. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, so can I, can I continue? Uh, give me a sign of approval. Yes. 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 <laughs> Thank you. No, no, I was not asking for applause. I simply wanted to make sure the connection was working. So, okay. <laughs> essentially, uh, the critics uh, uh, told, uh, said that uh, unless you make a pill out of these probiotics, uh, uh, this project is not viable because you cannot go all over Africa and teach all women how to prepare probiotic yogurt. So they made a pill. Essentially, they took the same microbes that they had used to ferment the milk to make a yogurt. They took the same identical microbes, they put them in a pill, and then they give these encapsulated probiotics or these pills to the same population. And so uh, one year later, they published this paper effect of 20 weeks probiotic supplementation on immune function of HIV patients. Same research group, same microbes, but a very interesting difference. In the first study, the successful one, they were fermenting the milk, so they were giving a probiotic yogurt. In the second study, they were not giving any yogurt, they were giving simply the microbes that had been encapsulated. Results, zero, nothing. Essentially, there was no efficacy in preserving the immune function. And essentially, the microbes didn't do anything. The CD4 remained where they were. There was no increase in CD4. So they concluded that it was not the microbes themselves, but it was what the microbes had done to the milk during the, pre the process of fermentation. So as you can see, 
the relationship between the microbiota and the immune system is not an easy one. It's not simply uh, swallow a couple of pills with probiotics and all diseases will be gone. And that's absolutely not like this. So essentially they concluded that uh, this discrepancy may be the result of using encapsulated probiotics versus the use of probiotic yogurt, even though the probiotic strains uh, were the same. However, and this is also very interesting, and again may please uh, Professor Luc Montagné, uh, because uh, they showed some unexpected results that they didn't bother to highlight. And actually it was uh, because uh, of my obsessive compulsive disease that I look at every single detail of papers and this delays a lot of my research that I found something truly interesting. Of course, I anticipate it may simply be a mistake. And if it, but if it were a mistake, they should have corrected it in particular because we told them about this and they say, oh no, no, nothing to be worried about. Okay, let's not be worried about, but let's look at this detail that may be enlightening. So uh, again, how did they perform this study? A rather simple protocol. Uh, they took, in this case, women with HIV. And uh, to an arm of the protocol, they gave them the encapsulated probiotics. And to the other group, they did not give any probiotics. Then they checked for CD4s and they found no difference. So they concluded, OK, the encapsulated probiotics do not work. But of course, in order for the study to be properly performed, they had to be inclusion criteria. So they, they couldn't take uh, uh, random women. They had to take uh, women who had confirmed HIV infection, but still a relatively high number of CD4s, so they were not eligible to be treated uh, with ARVs. So essentially, they went to the local hospital and they performed all the analysis and in English, and I guess in all languages of the world, confirmed HIV infection means that they have done ELISA and Western blot, otherwise it is not confirmed. So here they have a women with confirmed HIV infection with still a high CD4. And again, what they do is they divide. So they have 229 women screened and 65 women uh, deemed eligible for the study, so they were confirmed HIV positive and high CD4s. 33 are assigned to placebo, and 32 are assigned to probiotics. Then a few of them are lost. Uh, three never showed up in this group, and four never showed up for follow-up studies. Two started the ART, because evidently they were scared, the CD4s had, went, uh, had gone down, and two here had start ART. Three here were excluded for some reason, so let's uh, look at fine, fine print. And here, seven were excluded for some reason. So again, 32 women assigned to probiotics. We already know that there was no change in CD4, so evidently probiotics didn't do much to the immune system. Out of these 32, seven were excluded. Why were there? they excluded. Usually nobody reads these footnotes. Well, E, out of these seven, four because uh, CD4 numbers were not good. One, the CD4 was invalid. Two, had become HIV negative. Well, you may say, well, that was a mistake. Well, if it were a mistake, then all of this screening was wrong because uh, if they didn't know if they were confirmed HIV or not, uh, then the entire study makes little sense. But assuming that they had done their work properly at the lab analysis, and so these, all these women were confirmed HIV, well, what would you conclude? That in this group, you have two women who have become HIV negative. So this is written in plain English. Again, you can take a look at this paper. We wrote them several emails. They were unable to explain, and they simplistically concluded, oh, that was a mistake. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> we accept, but that's a nevertheless interesting, because this leads to the very famous word that you can find in all websites. If you have a good immune system, then your body can get, naturally get rid of HIV. Well, who knows what had, had happened to these women, but if you look in detail in the literature, in the newspapers, you find more than one case of HIV negativization. And this, interestingly, even though it's not heralded as such, is in a mainstream peer review paper. 
Now, uh, let's go back to the role of the uh, gut microbiota or microbiome in HIV. Uh, which comes first? <clears throat> Well, let's uh, simply read the summary of this uh, study that was published uh, just a few weeks ago in January 2018. And it says that studying the human host microbiota interaction suggests that the consequences of HIV infection on microbial composition can influence immune status in HIV patients. So, here essentially it doesn't say anything new. Uh, but here, uh, something interesting is that uh, ART, uh, antiretroviral therapy, induces microbiome changes. And this is rather obvious because just like antibiotics or steroids or uh, most drugs, they induce microbiome changes that are independent of HIV infection. So we could say a side effect of antiretroviral therapy. And some imply that ART may enhance dysbiosis. And, well, and this may not sound very encouraging. And uh, uh, they say the studies and trials evaluated the effects of administering probiotics and prebiotics, finding a potential benefit on inflammation markers and immune cell activation. And also they elaborate on fecal microbial transplantation. So what I'm saying is that now in 2018, it is uh, uh, slowly acknowledged that antiretroviral therapy uh, may not be good for your uh, microbiota. And since we know the microbiota is essential for the functioning of the immune system, well, you draw your conclusions. And now, what about the brain microbiota? This is something uh, that also comes from HIV research. It, I could say it's a byproduct or a spin off of HIV research that led or is leading to very, very interesting conclusions. Now, if you go again to PubMed and you look for brain microbiota, uh, as I did a few days ago, you end up with a, a significant number of papers, about 1,072 at the last count. But all these papers actually they talk about the relationship between the gut microbiota and the brain. And we know that there is a, a very strict relationship. Essentially, uh, the way we think, uh, our mood, uh, the way our mind works is uh, heavily influenced uh, by the working of the microbiota, mainly in our gut. And then there are all these complex interactions uh, between the hypothalamic, pituitary, adrenal axis. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we all know by now uh, that uh, our brain is heavily influenced by the microbial composition, in a, mainly in our gut, but not only there. But this is simply an influence, and I think everybody agrees by now <clears throat> that by changing the microbial composition of our gut, we also change the working of our minds and our brains, up to the point that people joke and say, well, uh, my microbes made me do this or something like this, which is a kind of fun, <clears throat> but it's a reflective of a general consensus. Let me drink a sip of water and I'll be back in just a second. <clears throat> However, the very first paper in a peer reviewed journal in PubMed mentioning the brain microbiota, that is the microbes that are peculiar of the brain, actually was published by myself in 2016 in a journal dedicated to surgical clinical endoscopy and in a commentary to fecal microbiota transplantation where I elaborate on the concept of how the brain microbiota that of course can be influenced by fecal microbiota transplantation as well as by probiotics of course is implied in the development of a number of neurologic or neuro uh, developmental diseases ranging from autism to neurodegenerative diseases. So now we have uh, to uh, talk about a different concept. In 2009 in Auckland, we were talking about gut dysbiosis. As of today, we can talk about brain dysbiosis. <clears throat> All this comes from HIV research. This paper that went almost unnoticed both in the HIV AIDS community, medical scientific, whether mainstream or not, and also in the more general scientific community, uh, is truly a breakthrough paper. It was published in PLOS One, it's an open access, freely available online, published in 2013 by researchers working 
predominantly, well, only in Canada. And now, what did these researchers do? <clears throat> the goal of their uh, study was mm, a rather simple one. They wanted to see uh, if uh, people who had died of AIDS, so were severely immunodeficient, they had microbes in their brains. And they were looking for pathogenic microbes, of course. They wanted to see the signs of encephalitis, encephalomyelitis, meningitis, and all this makes sense because if you are immune deficient, it is highly likely that you may have pathogenic, like uh, uh, microbes that usually don't cause any disease, but they may become so uh, if you are immune depressed, opportunistic microbes in your brain. So the uh, beginning of the study was a rather trivial one. I mean, they didn't expect uh, big surprises. Surprises came when they were asked to perform controls. So to check for the absence of microbes in the brains of healthy individuals who had either undergone surgery for some reason or had died with a perfectly competent immune system. So now they had uh, two types of brains. Brains of people who had died because of, or were died with immune deficiency and people who had died with a perfectly functioning immune system. Guess what? They found microbes and actually the same microbes in both brains. So they had to write these words. In an organ, which is the brain, widely assumed until then to be free of infectious agents or to be free of microbes in general, to be sterile, in the absence of a specific disease, disease process, of course, if you have encephalitis, you find the microbes, autopsied and surgically derived human brain specimens showed a restricted but distinct bacterial population in the present studies, which was composed of bacterial classes chiefly recognized in the physical environment, soil and water. The sources of these agents might include oral consumption or inhalation, with eventual transport to the brain as intracellular agents inactivated leukocytes trafficking into the brain. And the brain is constantly surveyed by trafficking leukocytes, activated lymphocytes and macrophages, which provide a Trojan horse mechanism for microbial entry into the nervous system across the blood-brain barrier. So essentially, what do they say? that the microbes that are in our environment, soil and water, are also in our brains. And these, in the absence of any immune dysfunction, in the absence of any disease, in the absence of any encephalitis or meningitis. So there is a brain microbiota. And by the way, a distinct brain microbiota is not the same as a microbiota in the gut. So this is a completely new concept because now we know that in our brains we don't have only neurons and glial cells, we also have microbes. And as they say, their capacity, the capacity of the microbes for influencing brain function is immense. Well, I think this is a truly a revolutionary statement because uh, uh, this means that the microbes are cells of our brains and their influence on the function of our brains is immense. And I think immense is a superlative, there is nothing more than immense. And uh, they also uh, hypothesized that the microbes in our brains may have been responsible for the evolution of the human brain itself. Why? Because at that point they were in, puzzled and intrigued and they went looking for microbes in the brains of all animals that they could they put hands on. And they found the microbes in the brains of apes, but they did not find any microbes in the brains of other mammals, like cats, dogs, or mice. So even though other mammals had perfectly functioning brains, and actually they lived in an environment where they could have found a number of microbes, their brains were sterile. The only brains, apparently, that have microbes as constituents of their or constituents of their brains in their uh, skull are uh, big apes and humans and uh, <coughs> they also uh, demonstrated that these microbes do not derive from other parts of the body uh, they do not derive from the gut they are specific and they are called alpha proteobacteria 
And uh, they also uh, postulated a function for these microbes. Uh, they say that these microbes have an immense influence on the functioning, but what could be one of the functions? And they say, well, the alpha proteobacteria, that is the microbes we have in our brains, they detoxify the environment. So they remove what uh, uh, people call toxins. Uh, I prefer to call them toxicants or metabolites from the brain. And these might have been instrumental in the development, in the evolution of the human brain. We did some research on this topic and about one year ago, we published this paper together with Dr. Jerry Blighty from Indianapolis in USA, uh, demonstrating how microbes uh, they are instrumental in removing neurotoxins, in, in this case uh, from uh, Dr. Jerry Blights, uh, and uh, may have been instrumental in removing a neurotoxin, so in protecting our brains uh, during the evolution of the brain. So you can download this paper for free. I go back so you can look. Uh, it is uh, published in the Madrid uh, Journal of Immunology. It's a case report. Just look uh, for my name and Pacini or Blighty and you will find it. And in this paper, we demonstrate how probiotics, uh, they increase uh, dramatically the excretion of toxicants from the urine. So you can eliminate uh, toxicants uh, that are very widespread in the environment. Uh, here you have a long list of the toxicants that we studied uh, from aphthalates, uh, to perchlorate, to agent orange, a number of these uh, toxicants that unfortunately are widespread in the environment. And their elimination through urines uh, was uh, tripled or incredibly uh, increased following a probiotic consumption, thus confirming the role of microbes in detoxification. But also another important and interesting uh, uh, corollary from that paper published by the Canadian researchers uh, is that uh, these microbes uh, can populate the brains of mice. Uh, so uh, you can transfer them in the brains of mice. So evidently it's a choice uh, for mice, evolutionary choice for mice not to have those microbes. And uh, <coughs> the microbes, uh, they can reside in the brains of other animals as well. And uh, um, this also implies that we have a way now to modify our brain microbiota. They did this in mice because of course you cannot do these experiments with human brains, but at least they laid the foundation for a possible modification of the brain microbiota, just as we modify the gut microbiota by simply assuming pre and probiotics. And how uh, was this related uh, to the evolution of the human brain? Well, an important factor here is uh, cranial capacity. Uh, our cranial capacity is much bigger, much higher than that of our ancestors. And so since uh, we have a bigger uh, cavity in our skull, we can accommodate a bigger brain. And this might be due to probiotics as well. So we might imagine that our ancestors began to eat probiotics. Of course, they didn't buy them at the local grocery store, but simply they were eating fermented foods. And fermented foods are nothing else than probiotics, like the probiotic yogurt that was used in Tanzania. Now, we know that uh, the cranial capacity is determined by a gene that is called RANX2. This is a paper, one of the last papers I published before I retired from the University of Florence in 2015. Actually, I retired in 2014. This was published after I had left, where we described the role of this gene in, uh, in human brain evolution because this gene is the one that determines the cranial capacity, how big is uh, the uh, the capacity of our skull to accommodate a larger brain. And now, what's interesting, and this also was published in PLOS One in 2013, so almost contemporary research, that this gene, uh, RANX2, is under the control of probiotics. So in other words, probiotics, they have influenced, or microbes, they have influenced uh, the evolution of the human brain possibly by help of detoxification and also by increasing the cranial capacity. 
Now, uh, let's move forward and still assuming you're still there, I can see you and you're still awake. So just give me a sign that I can go ahead and I've not bored you to death. Yes, I see a thumb up, which is a almost universal sign of approval. So uh, stay with me for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. I, I think I've had uh, one hour allocated. So let's talk about the role of the microbiota in aging as it relates to HIV. Now, uh, also this is something strange and rather novel because it looks like a normal aging and HIV appear to share similar alterations of the microbiota. <clears throat> Again, very recent research, current opinions, HIV AIDS, January 2018. You may notice that in between the lines, without much fanfare, uh, the mainstream AIDS research is publishing things that were considered terribly uh, controversial, deni denialist, uh, uh, rethinking type things only 10 years ago. And now they are published in the mainstream HIV AIDS journals. So this paper that was published a few weeks ago says, increasing evidence suggests a significant link in changes in the composition, diversity, and functional aspects of intestinal microbiome with normal aging and HIV infection. So here they take two completely different situations, aging, normal aging, and HIV infection, which is supposed to be a disease. And they demonstrate that the alterations of the gut microbiota is the same. And then they conclude that the impact of the microbiome alterations on inflammation, immune and organ senescence and mechanism by which biobehavioral pathways, biobehavioral pathways, something that was at the topic of the first paper published by Peter Duisberg on the chemical hypothesis of AIDS, biobehavioral pathways, will exacerbate these outcomes and these that need to be further evaluated. Why not? So uh, you have to be able to read in between the lines. But I think uh, that uh, one day, it, one day the so-called denialists uh, will prove right. At least uh, they will never admit this, but this is what it looks like. So essentially uh, this paper and many other papers say that normal aging and HIV infection show the same alterations of the microbiome. And also this is an interesting paper that actually is not uh, young anymore because this was published in 2014. And this review article uh, highlights how HIV is a model of accelerated or accentuated aging. So these were researchers from Australia uh, and USA. And it's a very interesting paper that you can download for free like most of the papers I've been showing today. So essentially HIV and aging, they go together. And because of this, uh, we felt compelled to write uh, this paper in a new journal, which is called the BioAccess, uh, BioAccent Open Journal of HIV. And uh, here we postulate uh, how a particular formulation of probiotics uh, may delay or even reverse aging, both in HIV, which is taken as a model of aging, as well as in normal aging. Also, this paper can be downloaded for free, and it was published, uh, let me see, just a, a few days ago. Let me iconize, move this. Yes, was published at the end of 2017. Now, uh, let's move uh, to something uh, rather old, uh, the Bible. The first books of the, of the Testament, Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the first five books, According to these books, uh, the antediluvian and post-diluvian patriarchs lived for hundreds of years, having sons and daughters, which means in good health, until the end of their exceptionally long lives. And these are many quotations from the Bible. As you know, there are many Bible studies. And Seth lived uh, 912 years, and Mahal lived 895. Methuselah, we all know he was very old, 969 years and so on. So you may say, oh, well, but you know, these are estimates, so you don't have to 
take the literal, literal meaning of the Bible because it has a deeper, different meaning, so you don't have to take the Bible as it were a peer-reviewed paper published in PubMed. So, okay, let's forget about this interpretation of the Bible and let's go to PubMed. Let's see what PubMed says. Well, curiously, PubMed in prestigious papers uh, like those published by the European Molecular Biology Organization, EMBO stands for European Molecular Biology Organization in Heidelberg, well, they talk about the same thing, time, eternity, and the promise of extending human life, or death as an unnatural process. Why is it wrong to seek a cure for aging? And you can find many, many papers uh, essentially uh, describing how uh, physical immortality or radical life extension is something that is scientifically sound and consistent with what we know about biology. Now, in our quest for immortality, we found two odd allies. One was Cloto, or Cloto if you prefer, which is a deity or a fate belonging to ancient Greek mythology, is the one who spins the thread of life of gods and humans, created the alphabet, and is responsible for the fate of all people in society. So this is one of the two elements that we use to study this topic. And the other is a humble little mammal, sort of a rodent, sort of a little rat, that lives in the deserts of North Africa. It is called Heterocephalus glaber, also known as a desert mole rat, or naked mole rat. And this little animal lives 10 times as long as the other rodents, and it is the equivalent of 900 human years. But most important, it is fertile for all the duration of its long life. It's practically immune to cancer and all degenerative diseases, suffers no brain damage due to oxygen deprivation, suffers no pain, and interestingly, the risk of death doesn't go up as the animal grows older, as it does for every other non-mammalian species, including ourselves. And the adult and make more rats have a daily chance of dying of about one in 10,000, and this chance remains the same, actually decreases with aging. And to be honest, nobody knows how long these animals live because the first breeding in captivity of these rodents were established about 30 years ago. And you know, the average lifespan of a mouse is about two years. So to live 30 years is like to live 10 times what is your biological lifespan, the equivalent of 1,000 years for a man. Uh, but they might live even longer because uh, researchers began observing these animals only 30 years ago. And uh, there are many articles that you can find uh, if you look for naked mole rats that defy the biological law of aging. Uh, but let's. Uh, try to understand which is the secret for the healthy longevity of these little animals that defy the so-called Gompers law, that uh, is a law that was established in 1825 by this British mathematician saying that essentially your chance of dying increase with aging, which is a rather trivial observation, but not for this animal. Well, this paper was published about one year ago less than one year ago in 2017 by researchers working in Germany, Ethiopia, and Italy. And they tried to find whether the secret of the healthy longevity of the naked mole rat was actually in the microbiome. And what they found confirms this hypothesis. So they studied this animal because it's an excellent model for healthy aging and longevity. And they found that it has an interesting intestinal microbial ecosystem able to use a soil sulfate. Please remember this name, sulfate, because it will come back in a few slides. But what was interesting in this study is that they found that the same microbes were found in the gut of centenarians, people who live more than 100 years humans, or has the hunter-gatherers that are considered a model of healthy gut microbiome because they are not exposed to all types of toxicants. And in addition, they, these are their words, they found an enrichment of short-chain fatty acids and carbohydrate degradation products. Also, please remember these two classes of molecules because they will come back. Essentially, this is my conclusion, it is the microbiota, not the DNA whether human or rodent, 
that is responsible for a healthy longevity and resilience to diseases. So in other words, the DNA of these animals is almost identical to the DNA of all other rodents and uh, the DNA of centenarians is almost identical to the DNA of people who die young. Uh, but what is uh, different is the microbiota. Again, highlighting the importance of the microbiota for our health, longevity, and immunity against all types of diseases. But there is more. Essentially, by looking at what uh, the microbes did, uh, essentially looking at the metabolites they could find in the stools of these animals as well as in the stools of centenarians. They found that it is what the microbiota produces, not the microbes in themselves. So this is a parallel with the probiotic yogurt. It's not the microbes, it's what the microbes produce that is responsible in the case of the probiotic yogurt in Tanzania for the rise in cd 4 in this case for healthy longevity. So it is what the microbes produce that is responsible for healthy longevity and resilience. And what is that they produce? Oligosaccharides, small molecules made by certain sugars. Now, uh, we are closer to the end of my presentation. This might be truly boring or uh, difficult to understand and I guess you are tired but uh, if you give me 10-15 more minutes at the most uh, I promise that then I will conclude I will not bother you anymore. So I hope to see another thumb up. Uh, if I don't uh, I stop it here. Okay I see it now <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Okay, so let's take a quick step back. Step back. Will you have time for questions, please, Marco? I beg your pardon? Will you have time for questions? Oh, absolutely. I have plenty of time. I have all morning. It's only 8.20 a.m. over here. The uh, point is that whether you still have strength, but if you do, uh, yes, I have plenty of time. So let's go back to a few papers I published in 2017. Uh, this uh, may horrify you because I'm talking about uh, HIV DNA vaccine. So I put together uh, three words uh, that will horrify a number of people. But if you read this paper, you will find out that I have not changed and I have not changed my mind. But you know, sometimes, uh, and John Shenton knows real well, uh, you have to be a little bit tricky to have uh, your papers or your movies published. So here, <laughs> I describe a universal delivery system for empowering vaccines, uh, taking inspiration by a study published in St. Petersburg by Russian uh, researchers who were working on an HIV DNA vaccine. And here I describe, and actually I give for free to the scientific medical community, if they wish to use it, a universal method for cancer or Alzheimer vaccines. So it is all written here. Everybody can enjoy, no patent, no intellectual property, no money involved, how to empower vaccines for cancer or Alzheimer, or if you uh, wish for HIV, if you like, like those people in St. Petersburg. This paper led to another one that was published in the Journal of Neurology and Stroke, describing how the Alzheimer DNA vaccine may induce relativistic time dilation. And I will elaborate on this point later. I'm simply giving you and the logical sequence that led to what I'm about to say. And this led to uh, this clotho gene. Uh, what is clotho? Well, clotho, again, let's leave the Greek fate aside and let's talk about the clotho gene and the clotho protein. Uh, clotho is a transmembrane multifunctional protein and it is known that it counteracts aging, extends lifespan, protects against age-associated morbidities, including uh, uh, the decline of immune system function. And because of these strategies aimed at increasing its circulating levels prove useful in the experimental animal in counteracting aging and age-associated conditions. However, clotho is a complex protein, so you cannot think of simply having a pill containing a clotho and you swallow a pill, and you increase the levels of clotho, and you defy aging. Unfortunately, it doesn't work like this. And because of this, 
In that paper, I describe a novel integrated multi-pronged approach that is based on microbiome medicine and has the goal of increasing the levels of this protein, as well as of inducing a relativistic time dilation and quantum entanglement at the level of DNA. Now, the next couple of slides are rather boring, so don't bother to read them. By the way, you already have all the slides. You can uh, go in depth if you wish. And let me just <coughs> highlight the major concepts. Uh, this approach is based on four factors that amplify each other in targeting a clot expression and signaling. The first factor are orally available microbiological enhanced transcription factors that are known to increase clot expression. One is vitamin E and the other is vitamin D. And you may say, well, we can find a lot of vitamins in the grocery store, but these are microbiologically enhanced. So just as I said, both in the case of the NECMO rat or the probiotic yogurt in Tanzania, the microbes, uh, they do a lot to uh, common foods or common supplements. And by modifying these uh, vitamins, uh, they enhance their ability to induce or regulate transcription at the level of DNA, that is, uh, to regulate the function of DNA. Plus, uh, the microbes, they also produce another molecule that is called a lithocholic acid, it is a non-calcemic ligand for the vitamin D receptor. You know, one of the side effects of vitamin D is that may raise uh, your calcium levels too high and you may end up with kidney stones or other very unpleasant side effects. Lytocholic acid that is produced by these microbes uh, uh, stimulates the receptor of vitamin D without uh, messing up with calcium levels. The second approach are microbial enzymes mimicking the enzymatic function of cloto. In other words, the strains of this formula, they produce cloto or cloto-like molecules, transforming the gut in a natural bioreactor for production of cloto. So again, we are exploiting the concepts that were first highlighted by Ride in 2010, where when he demonstrated that it was the yogurt, not the microbes, uh, responsible for the uh, improved function of the immune system. So these microbes, uh, they produce clotho. And also, uh, these microbes, they enhance the function of a compound that has been known for quite some years, chondroitin sulfate. You remember sulfate was one of the secrets of the Nekmo rat for its healthy longevity. Now, we know the chondroitin sulfate, which is a common supplement, is endowed with healthy properties ranging from anti-aging to immune modulation neuroprotection. We will see there are patents to use chondroitin sulfate in, as an antiretroviral, a fully natural supplement anti with antiretroviral activities. But in our approach, the healthy gut microbiota metabolizes the chondroitin sulfate, leading to production of the oligosaccharides the same that were responsible for the healthy longevity of the NECMO rat. Now, these oligosaccharides are composed by two molecules called glucuronic acid and N-acetylgalactosamine. And here we go full circle because L-acetylgalactosamine is the active site of the GCMAF macrophage activating factor that we described in 2010 in Vienna the mainstream, a full mainstream, 18th uh, conference on AIDS. So uh, we see that we go full circle and we can produce the same molecules uh, through a number of different mechanisms. Now, as I say, the chondroitin sulfate and its oligosaccharides are well-known natural antiretroviral agents. And there are patents by Luitpold Pharma, so big German pharma, and also patents coming from Asia, describing how chondroitin sulfate and different uh, oligosaccharides are uh, useful. Well, these are patents, so people have put money on these. It's not simply speculation in a, in a paper published in a predatory journal. These are patents where people put money, and where, when you put money where your mouth is, this is a good sign. So here they say, uh, chondroitin sulfates for the treatment of immune deficiencies, plural, caused by retroviruses, plural. And uh, this other patent is for treatment of diseases caused by retroviruses in general. And also if you go for chondroitin sulfate and uh, retroviruses in PubMed, 
you'll find a number of papers uh, that have been uh, sedimented for a few years. This was published in 2013. Uh, and this describes the effects of this type of chondroitin sulfate on human T uh, cell leukemia virus type 1, which was, by the way, the first virus uh, first uh, described by Gallo. So again, uh, things uh, tend to come to full circles. Now, uh, and uh, what we found is that these oligosaccharides, they bind to DNA and they have a role as adaptogens. So they look for areas of DNA that are not properly functioning. In a molecular biology, we say that are not properly expressed. And they restore the expression, working as a class of drugs that are called histone deacetylase inhibitors. This is a class of pharmaceutical drugs that have been used in HIV as well. And this is a paper that was published quite recently, again, in the open access. And here they describe how uh, histone deacetylase inhibitors, they increase the number of cells of the immune system. And also, this class of drugs is a potential therapeutic treatment for neurodegenerative diseases, again, tracing a link between aging, neurodegeneration due to Alzheimer or other uh, neurological diseases and HIV. Evidently, all these different conditions, they have something in common. This something is the microbiota. The gut microbiota for sure, the brain microbiota most likely. Uh, and we know that these are drugs, uh, uh, they're useful in cancer therapy and inflammatory diseases, uh, in immune response, in regulating the immune responses, uh, in multiple sclerosis. So we know that uh, histone deacetylase inhibitors, they may be useful in a number of chronic conditions from HIV AIDS to cancer, Alzheimer, multiple sclerosis. And now we have a way to induce the microbes in our gut to produce fully natural uh, histone deacetylase inhibitors. And this leads to the final part of my talk, how these molecules induce relativistic time dilution and biological quantum entanglement, as I described in this paper published in November 2017. Now, these molecules, they bind to DNA. When they bind to DNA, they induce a phenomenon that was first described by Einstein more than 100 years ago, which is called relativistic time dilation. And this enable us to modify at will the fabric of space-time at the level of DNA. And these uh, may bear unimaginable consequences because as we slow down the passing of time at the level of DNA, everything about medicine will be revolutionized. Why? Because our cells will have time to repair damages both to the genome and the epigenome. Diseases, therefore, will be cured from the inside before they manifest themselves and hopefully humans will be entitled to live without aging. Now, uh, we know real well that gravity and time are closely related. And this is not something exotic or only for uh, science fiction books or movies. This, um, this is something that works in our daily lives. The closer you are to a gravitational mass that is the center of Earth, the slower time flows. So when you are up in the sky, like the satellites for the GPS navigator, time flows faster. And actually the engineers who uh, program the GPS navigators, they have to take into consideration this difference in the flow of time between the satellite up in the sky and the car down on Earth. So it's something very practical, something that it is at work in almost all aspects of daily life. However, differences in time flow can be observed even at much smaller scales. That is half a meter. If you climb on your chairs, then time will run faster because you're far away from the center of Earth uh, than if you are sitting uh, on your chairs or even better if you're sitting on the floor. And so this can be measured and this also works at the level of DNA. So we were able to induce relativistic time dilation at the level of DNA thanks to these molecules produced by the microbes. And if time runs slower, as I said, cells will have extra time 
so that their repair mechanism can perform their tasks and slow down aging at the level of DNA. And what about the very last topic I wish to share with you, biological quantum entanglement. <clears throat> this is a, another type of information that is embedded in DNA. I'm sure that you remember that in 1953, Watson and Crick were working at a Trinity College in Cambridge, England, they discovered the so-called code of life, uh, the sequence of nitrogen bases in DNA, ATGC, adenine, thymine, uh, cytosine, and guanine. And they made movies out of this. There was a movie a few years ago called Gattaca, that is the sequence of GATT, and so on. So everybody knows uh, that the biological information is in the sequence of DNA, and this is absolutely true. Uh, no way to disprove this. But a few years ago, together with a colleague of mine, Stefano Terini, we published in the prestigious Encyclopedia of Cancer another level of information in DNA. You know, DNA is a very, very long molecule, about a two meters of DNA inside each one of the billions and billions of cells in our body, not to mention the DNA in all our friendly microbes. Now, these long, highly charged molecules, they work like fractal antennas, like the antennas of your radio. And fractal antennas, or antennas in general, they're able to send and receive signals under the form of electromagnetic waves. And here we may open the enormous chapter on the influence of electromagnetic fields on the functioning of the cells in our body. And actually, that's the topic of this chapter of ours in the Encyclopedia of Cancer. So DNA sends and receives signals under the form of electromagnetic waves. And we all know that these types of signals, they work through quantum entanglement. You know, quantum entanglement in itself may require hours of explanation, but I'm sure that if you just go to Wikipedia, you can have a good, a good idea of what quantum entanglement is. Let me tell you that quantum biology and quantum medicine represents a fascinating and novel field where the effects of quantum physics are observed in biological processes ranging from human consciousness to photosynthesis, bird navigation, and DNA function. Uh, this paper is published uh, by a colleague of mine, Professor Stu Amerov. He works in Tucson, a couple of hours southeast from where I'm talking right now at the Arizona State University. And he has worked a lot and published a lot on the uh, quantum basis for consciousness and consciousness of the universe in itself. And I uh, suggest that you take a look at these concepts because they're truly fascinating. At the level of DNA, quantum entanglement is responsible for its implications in the ability of DNA to retain, process, and transmit information under the form of electromagnetic waves. This is a paper published on this topic uh, uh, at Cornell University. And uh, the interaction of highly charged disaccharides, those disaccharides, again, that were found in the stools of the name Porat, they derive from the work of the microbes on the precursors, so in this case, uh, from microbiological enhanced chondroitin sulfate, the quantum entanglement between their electron clouds with a multimolecular structure constituted by DNA and proteins modifies the quantum properties of DNA. And therefore, it enhances or restores, if you prefer, its ability to retain, process, and transmit information that is entangled at the quantum level. I think that I've messed your brains enough. And so looking at these beautiful chemical trails in the sky of Arizona, and this could be a topic of an entire conference, if you wish, and looking also at these uh, uh, high voltage wires. So again, electromagnetic fields, everything is connected. And of course, I'm joking. Uh, I stop it here. I thank you so much. And I'm open to questions uh, if you may wish to spend a few more minutes with me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.